<laughs> How y'all doing? I'm Joshua Wiley, and this is part two, y'all. Part two from earlier, and y'all gotta excuse me. I'm gonna apologize for the first, the first part. Y'all might say what you apologize for. I, I just, it's, it's, uh, I was editing the video right before I started this one because I had to let the battery charge on the camera, and I realized my face was so big on the playback, you know. And I was like, wow, you know, people get on their phone, they're like, whoa, you know what I'm saying? That was not done on purpose. Like, like most of y'all know I've been recording my videos on my phone, and today I've decided to use the camera, and it's been so long. So I tried to zoom out a little bit so my face ain't just so, but it still might be it. But anyway, we're going to get right into it. Now, this is part two. Uh, God gave me, like I said, he gave me the dream that judgment is starting in the church. And then, as I'm sitting there, he said, not only, this is the beauty of God, not only will he give you a warning, but he, God goes into detail on where the problem lies so you can fix the problem. God isn't one of the people who just accuse, point fingers and say do this without offering a solution. And I've said that many times and I believe that in my personal life. If I'm not giving somebody a solution or I'm not willing to help them with the solution, can I sit and even talk about the problem? Let me say that again. If, you, if you're not willing to help the person with the solution, and offer a solution then don't even talk about the problem because then that makes you just an accuser that makes so God so he, he says judgment he told me this morning like if you saw the first part the judgment is about to begin in the church well it's already begun but it's entering its final phases and and one of the main issues in the church uh, is what I like to call the abomination of desolation. There's so many issues, but we're, we're getting to the root and the bread of butter. And I'm going to show how certain things have been slighted since the beginning. And if you've already read the title, yes, we're going to deal. I'm dealing with, he told me, the Lord told me to uh, warn women elders and women priests. And the men, the priests, the ministers, and the elders who allow them to hold such titles and positions in the church because it's all about the title uh, 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 I've heard I used to live by this saying I heard this saying a long time ago the the title doesn't make a man the man makes the title so so don't get me wrong uh, what I'm saying is and I know uh, what God told me to share first off let's pray dear Heavenly gracious Father please Lord let me disappear and let your Holy Spirit speak, Father. Amen. Now I'm not saying that because God calls all of us to be royal, a royal of a royal priesthood, but God is a God of structure. And I've never done, I've never done a video concerning women's ordination. Even though people have asked me to, and in my in my personal circle, oh, friends and family have wanted to argue with me when it was. Uh, really big and adamant in the church even though the conferences have still gone rogue with it even though they, they the conferences voted against it they're still in uh, commissioning women to be pastors and elders and and honestly uh, my friends and family stopped coming because I, I go to the Bible and so they're like okay we can't win that conversation over with Joshua and I've never shared it on my YouTube you know because of everything else that was going on and and things of that nature but now I am and I'm gonna tell you first off as when I start uh, don't think I'm gonna argue with you in the comments about it I'm not gonna argue with you in the comments if y'all wanna argue amongst each other feel free but I'm showing Bible everybody I've talked to with about it always just showed opinion never never showed Bible or they would show some verses and would try to try to link it and make it the contextual the narrative of women ordination and um uh, so like I said, I'm not going to argue with you about it, but uh, if I have to do more videos on it, if y'all say, Josh, please even go deeper after this one, I will. I'm going to try to keep this short, even though I'm rambling right here, right now. I'm going to try to keep this short because there are so many stories in the Bible that the devil wants to keep hid. Like what I'm about to share with y'all, I was never taught this. And we're gonna we're gonna talk about first. I'm gonna talk about and 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 after after I break down women's ordination in a certain way, then I'm gonna show why 
I consider it a part, a major reason why I call it the abomination of desolation. The abomination of desolation. Uh, the Bible, there, there are certain things that are stated in the Bible that also mean one or two, 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 three, four, five things. I, I can hear somebody says saying in themselves now, no, Josh, the abomination of desolation means when when Titus and Crispus and Vespius, uh, Vespasius, ah, I don't say this name wrong, but Titus is dead. When they besieged Jerusalem, things of that nature, we're going to get into it because that is one of the meanings. That is one of the meanings. But I must show why I believe that women's ordination is also uh, uh, symbolic of the abomination of desolation. But like I say, let's get into it. The, the, one of the, the stories that I've also heard about, and, and I'm going to show, uh, when God told me to share this, I said, okay, Father. And I said, whew. But it's, he's doing it out of love. I have a lot of women. Well, I don't, I'm going to say a lot, but several. I have a couple women elders that I'm very good friends with and that I love dearly. And we've talked about it just a little bit. They they really didn't want to talk too much about it with me. Uh, only one talked about it with me. And uh, and I shared just a little bit. And, uh, you know, she said she'll pray on it and, and things of that nature. But she came at me. She asked me. and And so... God, what he told me to say is actually that, here we go. And I told him I'm his vessel to do, do whatever he tells me to say. When, when the church is judged, if you are a woman, elder, or minister, God makes it clear that is a, a, a abomination in the sanctuary. Now, now, what I'm not, I'm not saying, and I'm just talking about that title. When you, when you ordain or you commission and you put somebody in that title, as a matter of fact, that's what I was getting at earlier. Now, I'm not saying that a woman can't be, and that's why I brought up the saying, uh, the man makes the title. The title doesn't make the man because it's like my mother says, who is very spiritual, <laughs> you know, who I often talk to and things of that nature. I was just talking to with her, her a minute ago. Just do it. Why do you need the title? If you're a priest, uh, if you want to be a priest, like so, oh, I gotta be. It's, that's, and that's how you know it's all about the title. There are some women who just do. They they go out, they minister, and they do say. So. Now I'm not saying a woman should minister and sit there quiet like old school. They no. I'm talking about the title. Okay, it, go reach, go knock on doors, hold Bible studies, teach. Most of our school teachers are women. My Sabbath school teachers, when I was a little boy, who they were women, y'all. So definitely don't let the devil get in your head. Oh, he's saying I can't teach. Because some people will try to nitpick a point to try to and, and, and downgrade what you're saying and never listen. That is not what I'm saying. I'm saying if you teach, just teach. You want to reach people? Go reach people. Knock on doors, pass out literature, just do it. But why do you need the title? Why do you need to be ordained or commissioned? Why do you have to say, yes, I'm minister, uh, I'm, I'm minister uh, such and such, and yes, I'm priestess such and such, or I'm bishop such and such. Why? You have to ask yourself this. If you have an issue with it, why do you need that title? But I'm going to show you why in the Bible. What if I told you it all started in the garden? But I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Anyway, I'm going to talk about Gideon. And see, this is one of the, whenever I would bring up Gideon, whenever, I'm talking about elders, ministers, when this was a, a, a real heated topic in the church, they would lead the conversation along because I was, we were never taught this about Gideon. You know, they even started a church after Gideon. And how many times you, you see Gideon Bibles in hotel rooms and things. And I, 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 I got probably like seven Gideon Bibles in my bookshelf, like for real. But would we have that if we were ever taught what Gideon did after that great victory? Gideon, beloved, fell into abomination. Gideon became a detestable thing before the Lord, yes. And this is why I said, when you have ministers and elders who aren't reading the Bible in their personal time, they're not teaching their congregation the truth, the whole truth. You feel what I'm saying? Why wasn't I ever taught these things about Gideon growing up? All we heard was the, the mighty war Gideon did. And I believe, personally, I believe that the devil kept the true story. Well, didn't keep it here because it's right there in the Bible. But a lot of people don't study for themselves. You'd be surprised how much envy 
I used to get when I was teaching and preaching. Oh, Josh, you think you know it? But I just love reading. Look at my Bible. Look at the pages, y'all. Like, I love the, I love reading my word. You you can even see where my hand from where my thumb. See how it's dark right here? Because this is, that's, that's my habit. And I love reading. But anyway, let me show you. Let's go to Judges. Go to Judges 8. And if you've lasted this long and you believe in women's ordination, I want to thank you. Just hear me out. Let the Bible be your guide, not somebody else's opinion or some verses that they twist to try to make it uh, liable. Uh, but go to Judges. Let's go to Judges 8. Go to Judges 8. Go to Judges 8. And I'm going to start at verse 27. Again, go to Judges 8, and I'm going to start at verse 27. I'm going to try not to lean forward, because if I lean forward, my face, I'm going to be big face on your camera. I'm going to start at verse 27. Now, this is towards the middle. This is after Gideon won them great victories. And he just uh, kills two Midianite, Midianite kings. I always pronounce that word. But anyway, <laughs> verse 27. Again, I'm in Judges 7. I'm in Judges 8. I'm sorry. And I'm at verse 27. And it says, And Gideon made an ephod, which is a priestly garment. Okay, okay. Holy Spirit said you skip before he makes the ephod he goes to the Ishmaelites tells them to give all his gold earrings you can read this in the, in the verses before I'm giving you the context and he makes some gold idols can we say Gideon let the victory and the fame the fame of the victory that God gave him give him the big head he became a problem uh oh he, he, he got the big head he started to get the big head so he makes he forgets God how many of did y'all know this? When you read chapter 8, go ahead and read chapter 8. Well, where he starts to make the idols in chapter 8 is verse 22. He starts to make gold idols. Okay? And so, anyway, let's go to 27. And Gideon, so he makes an ephod and he puts it in his city, this priestly garment. Now, let me read the before. He puts it in his city, even in Oprah. And all Israel went there a whoring after it. Beloved. Gideon appointed himself a priest. Gideon led Israel into abomination. Let me read it again, because some, like I say, we, I wasn't taught this. Maybe you was, but I wasn't until I studied on my own. So, again, Gideon made a priestly garment, which is called an ephod thereof. We're in verse twenty-seven in chapter eight in Judges. And put it in his city and in Ophrah, and all Israel went there whoring. He basically said, I wrought this great victory. I have all this newfound fame. You know, people are, oh, Gideon, you're in, you're in direct contact with God. You must be a priest. Now, this is what it has to do with women's ordination. Beloved, Gideon became... Okay, let me finish verse 28. Verse 20. No, 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 no. Let me finish verse 27 before I get the deep on it. And Israel went there, a whoring after it, which thing became a snare unto Gideon and to his house. Thus Midian subdued the children of Israel, so that they lifted up their heads no more. And the country was in quietness forty years in the days of Gideon. Gideon became an abomination to the eyes of God. And so his house was punished for thereof. Why did he become an abomination? Not only because he made the idols. But it was because he appointed himself priest. And he didn't have the authority to do so. And somebody might say, well, Josh, what does that have to do with women's ordination? Look, beloved, God made a structure. And we know in Bible, in Bible, the only ones who were permitted to become priests were the Levites. The Levites. The only ones. Remember, uh, Stephen Bohr does a great, great sermon on Kor, Dathan, and Abiram. Uh, Kor, the rebellion of Kor. You know, when they when they tried to appoint themselves as priests and the ground opened up and God ended up swallowing them in the earth. Wow, an earthquake? An earthquake to swallow this abomination? What, not just talking about an earthquake when dealing with the house of God and judgment? <laughs> that just hit me, but we're going to connect some dots. We're going to keep connecting the dots. But anyway, 
Korah, so God is strict, like we saw with Korah, where Korah, and they had the spirit of the Holy, they had the Holy, the Holy Ghost upon them, and they still weren't allowed to become priests. Now look at Gideon. Gideon wrought a mighty work for the Lord. And that's that's what I say about my women, the women who uh, are in the church. You know, nobody's saying, because at first people would say, Josh, so you're saying that women can't do the work of the Lord? I'm like, no. Just like my mother would tell you, just do the work. My mother just does the work. She doesn't need the title. Just do the work. Knock on the doors. Do Bible studies. Love your neighbor. Love the law. Seek. Just do the work of the minister. God just says, but when you step in my sanctuary, which is his house. Now imagine, I can't go in my mama's house and make rules. Like real talk. Like, like I, I got my mama, like she'll look at me like I'm crazy and, and pretty much just drop, drop kick me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> hey, I cannot go in my mama's house and call myself making my own rules. Hmm. Y'all see what I'm getting at? So... Just when it's concerning the sanctuary, God says specifically, he gave the structure. Men, da 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 Not saying one is more than the other. Not saying one, oh, men are over women. No, everybody has their rightful roles and not one role is over. That's just the structure. I can't go in my mama's house and say, Mom, I know you got your cups in this cabinet, but... Why you got your bowls over here? Why don't you put the bowls over here and mix the cups over here? Well, it's not fair that the bowls, you know, I can't do that. That's my mama's house. But anyway, so I take that analogy with the Lord. You know, God has already shown you cannot, when it comes to his sanctuary, we can't just make ourselves and appoint anything. But like we're getting, cause, cause like I say, people use the argument Josh, a woman can bring people to the Lord like a man can. Yes, I salute, for real. Like I say, my Sabbath school teachers, I'm not that type of guy. No, a woman can't teach me nothing about the Bible, but yet most Sabbath school teachers are women. What kind of sense do that make? Most, most, the people who are teaching the children in the church about God at a young age are women. You know what I'm saying? Most Sabbath school teachers are women. So that's not what I'm saying. And so, and I'm not saying that God can't work mighty works through a woman. That is not what I'm saying. Because didn't God work mighty works through Gideon? Let me lean back. I don't want my face big. Didn't God work mighty works through Gideon? Yes. Mighty works. Delivered Israel. Won battles. Oh, I love the story of Gideon when he said, you know, take him to the river and lift it. I love that story. I love the works that God worked through Gideon. But could Gideon become priest? No. God said it became a snare unto him and to his house. Gideon became detestable to the Lord. Why? Because he tried to appoint himself priest. No, so this is my question. If Gideon who did all these mighty works for God and is a man, if he can't just appoint himself priest, then you telling me a woman who God said is, when he put the structure of the home up, said is you, because of Eve, you lost your authority to your husband. You, you are up under your, your, your husband. Now, all of a sudden, they can be priest? Aren't men supposed to be, aren't the leaders supposed to be the priest in the home? Isn't there conflict there? If the woman can be priest, and the man can be priest, but the man is head, wouldn't the priest, how are you going to have the woman priest and the man be the head? Isn't the priest the head? Isn't there conflict? Don't we see that today in homes? Conflict? Because the roles, people, the devil has cleverly gotten people to twist the roles. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm going to give Bible to that. I'm going to give Bible to that. So that's the one point I wanted to bring up with Gideon. That if Gideon wasn't allowed to become a priest and he's a man. And he did mighty works for God. So that kills that argument. Oh, because because I'm there, there. Some people might want to hold up certain women and say, oh, this, this girl, she brought... 300 people to the Lord in one year. You telling me she can't be a minister and become ordained? No. 
Did she do mighty, more mightier works than Gideon? No. And Gideon wasn't allowed to become priest. Korah, Dathan, Korah had the Holy Spirit. When, when Moses got frustrated and was tired and God put the Holy Spirit amongst the camp, Korah was one of them. Here Korah had the Holy Spirit and he still wasn't allowed to become a priest. And he was a man. But anyway, let's just show. I, want, I love using the example of Dorcas. Dorcas was so important to the mission of the church. Hear me. She was so important to the mission of the church that God and Peter was like, we're going to bring her back here. That's See, when you're valuable to the church, you'll be surprised how much mercy and compassion you get. That's why I love the story of Dorcas. She was so valuable to the mission that God said, uh-uh, we're going to keep you on earth alive a little while longer. We're going to bring you back to life. Now, when he brought her back to life, now here, now who did, she's already doing marvelous works for the church. And then she can boast that she was brought back to life. Was she then ordained? Did Peter ordain her as an elder and head of the church? No. But anyway, let's keep going by because I ain't going to beat that. Now, I want to show because I want to get deep into it, but I don't want to make this long. And like I said, uh, I, I am going to go further all week into what God told me to share. But anyway, it started in the garden, y'all. See, uh, this hit me when I was studying this earlier today. Eve actually wanted to be priest in the garden. The Satan spoke to her as priest and she didn't even realize it. Let's go, let's go. So hear me out, hear me out, hear me out, hear me out, hear me out. Someone's gonna say, what, Josh, you're reaching. You're reaching, Josh, what do you mean she wanted to be priest? Remember, go to Genesis 3, Genesis 3, and we're going to start at verse 5. In verse 5, where the serpent is talking to the woman. Satan is in speak, using the serpent as a vessel and speaking through him. He did not shape shift into a serpent. I'll do, I can do a video on that later too. But anyway, verse 5. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes a tree to, a tree to be desired to make one wise the tree didn't become good until she saw that she could be as god and become wise question in the home if uh in the church people listen to the priests and the elders in, in, in the Bible, there is no difference between a priest and an elder. You're, you're all priests. You're all ministers. You listen to him because you're, you're expecting to hear a word from the Lord. I hear people say, it out, give me that word from the Lord. Oh, I'm going to get me a word from the Lord today. So we know this. You go to the church cause in, and you listen to the elders and the priests give a sermon because you're, ex you're, 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 you're expecting them to give words directly from the throne on Most High. So the devil was telling Eve, you will be as God and you will become wise. Isn't that a priest? Didn't he just describe a priest? One who is as God, who should be as God and who is wise. But he's actually doing the structure. See, Satan had already, what we're talking about the, the fourth smartest mind in all the universe. Up under the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, then there was Lucifer. Okay? So he had already saw, because think about it. Like Y'all have heard me do uh, teachings on it, especially go back and watch The Curse of Unhappiness. Satan knew how to disrupt. Satan knew how to disrupt the family or break, a, break apart structure. Because he broke apart structure. That's what he was doing here. He knew God had appointed Adam. Now think about it. He 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 spoke to her, especially when it says to become wise. Why would and, and and I always like I say I'm visual and I always say, Lord, show me more. And I saw in the garden. Can you imagine? God, Adam had the command to name all the animals. Adam, we know Adam named all the animals. So Eve, he even named Eve. So you know Adam. Yeah, when he's taking Eve around. Yeah, I I, I called that the giraffe. That's the elephant. Oh, you see, those are butterflies. See how beautiful they are? Well, I named them butterflies. This is him talking to Eve. I named them butterflies. You don't, and, and 
No envy, no nothing sparked up in her. But she knew how wise Adam was. And 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 as and she she could also easily see how close to God he was. Remember, he was created perfect and he named everything and he had dominion. Adam was close to God. Now here comes the serpent, Satan, Satan speaking through the serpent and is saying, You can be you can be the priest in the home. Adam doesn't have to be the only one wise, the only one who speaks as the mouthpiece of God. You can too. Beloved, so basically what I'm saying is it was through women's ordination today and the so-called the 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 rebellious, the rebellious, abominable conferences. In the Adventist church, who after the conference said, we are not ordaining women. They, well, we're going to do this little loophole around it. And we're going to commission the women, elders and pastors. You're doing the work of Satan. Yes. Anyway. Through women, priests and women ministers and elders, Satan is still telling Eve, you can be the head and the priest in the home also. Adam isn't the only priest. You can be it too. And again, I stress it. If it's not about the title, then drop the title and just do the work. Beloved, this has been a day. Like I said, I showed y'all about which authority I teach. I've held on to this since my whole life. If Look at my testimony. I saw the great whore as a child, I just thought it was the devil. She was draped head to toe in blood and she looked at me with fire in her eyes. So much so that I told my mother, I had a head full of gray hair in the middle part of my head until I was like 11 years old. And people used to say, oh, that boy wise, that mean wisdom. I used to be like, nah, I saw something crazy. I saw something crazy. And she tried to pull, she tried to pull me out of my bed. One of my toes is black. Just the tip of my toe where she grabbed my foot. Anyway. I don't want to get off subject, but let's just say I always known that there was a good and evil without a shadow of a doubt. Always. There was never been a question in my mind because I saw demons. Like I say, I saw the great whore out of eye, which I just thought was the devil. And, and I saw demons. It, like if you look at my testimony, this isn't me just rambling. That's why I say go back to my testimony I even put up years ago. That's what taught me how to box. When they used to lock me in that room as a child, these old demons who looked like I call them hate because I, I, I can be real hateful if I let that old man come out of me. And they look, they were old and mean faces and I would, they would try to touch me and I would spend hours fighting them. And, and that's what taught me how to box. When people are like, oh, you're a natural. Like, I've been boxing. I used to bo do some crazy stuff. But anyway, I said, I said all that to say is that my eyes have always been different. Like I've all the Bible has always been an open book to me. That's why I love it. Like, and anyway, what I was getting to is I told my mom because of what I saw as a child. I, I told, I asked my mom. I said, well, really, I told. I said, Mama, I'm gonna study the four major religions. I was 12 years old, and I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna study Baptist. To me, these were the four major religions. I said, I'm gonna study Islam, Baptist, Pentecostal, and Adventists. And whichever one I think is true, that's what I'm gonna follow. And she said, sure. My, my mom was like, okay. But she she know her son. She know I'm, I'm stubborn. And hard hit it. And I was gonna do what I wanted to do anyway. And I and that's when I chose Adventism for myself because it was the only one that kept the Ten Commandments. But anyway, back to what we're talking about. And I just wanted to say, uh, because I know this is a touchy subject, and that's why I really didn't do a video before. And the Lord was like, I didn't give you the, the truth of this matter to hold on to it, Joshua. But anyway, I want to stress this again. Through women's ordination and eldership and commissioning that they do today, the rebellious conferences, it's through women's ordination that Satan is still telling Eve, you can be as God. You can be wise. You can be the head or the priest in the home. Beloved, this issue goes all the way back to the garden. And why does it go to... go? And this, I'm, I'm, Lord showed me, I said, well, Lord, show me more. You stay in the same chapter. We're in Genesis chapter 3. We're in Genesis chapter 3. And let's, we go to 15. We're going to go to 15. 
where he's he's punishing Eve, right? And he says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shall bruise his heel. Verse 16. This is key, y'all. This is key. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children. Thy de desire shall be to thy husband. He shall rule over thee. Now remember, Satan's sitting there watching. Women's ordination and headship, eldership, is directly going against, and he shall rule over thee. Because how can a woman be a minister or a priest, but still be subservient to her husband, who's supposed to be priest in the home? Only in the, this, this past hundred years have we seen this flood. Of women elders and priests only now and it's like you have to ask the question like I told somebody one time I said if you can give me one example of a female priest and elder not a prophet like cuz like I say Acts 2 17 and, and Joel 2 thy sons and thy daughters shall prophesy so I'm not saying prophets that's what I'm saying just you know I'm talking about when it comes to the sanctuary God's house the way my mama said Boy, shut that door, don't leave my door open. God's house and his rules in his pertaining to his house. Prophets bring visions to the world and people and, and spread messages. But we're talking about the rule and the headship in the house and in the church. See, right here in Genesis 3, in Genesis 3, 15 and 16, God, well, 3, 5, in Genesis 3, 16, God is giving the structure of the home. I got to pause and let that marinate. So when this is a matter of destroying Satan knew if he can cause because he's he did it in heaven. He understands God and structure and why it's set up for a reason. I'm going to show you more. You might say, OK, Josh, that's cool. I see that. But why would you call it the abomination of desolation? Go to Matthew. Let's go to Matthew 24. Go to Matthew 24. Like I say, this is one of my personal things, why I call it the abomination of desolation. I didn't get it from anybody else, you know. Uh, go to Matthew 24, and I'm going to start at verse 15. Well, let's start at verse... Holy Spirit said, read the whole thing. Because we're in the last days, right? We're in the last days. And like I said, this is concerning judgment in the church. And I want, to, I want you to see where this is placed. I want you to see where this is placed. This is key. The disciples just come to him. We're in Matthew 24 and verse 3. And I'm going to start at verse 3. And, and I'm going to read it kind of fast, y'all. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. That's the first thing. So what Christ is even saying... But, for, verse 5, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am in Christ, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. The first thing Christ says, usually the first thing is the most important, like a parent and like a, to a child and things of that nature. Christ is saying the, the most important thing that you're going to have to worry about in the last days is deception in every area of the gospel, in every area of gospel, including who can be a minister. Anyway. Verse 6, and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For a nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall... Many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. I wanted to read all that because don't we see all that now? We see all that now. I, there, I, see, I saw a dude that said he was a prophet. And, and I didn't want to say nothing because I was just... 
of just sitting back. And he didn't even know his Bible. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, you gonna say you're a prophet and you ain't even know such and such and such and such? Okay. Now, I ain't saying all prophets and messengers know the book by, you know, and can quote a whole book. But, you know, if a prophet said, come here, let me lay my hands on you and heal you. Just give me, put, put some money in the collection plate. We don't see that nowadays. Buy this magic rug or this cloth. Buy this prayer cloth. Because I'm prophetess uh, or I'm prophet uh, T T K such a, or I'm, 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 I'm prophetess or I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm prophet such and such. You already know. So we hear it like drinking water nowadays. We hear it like drinking water nowadays. Don't we see the love of many waxing cold? All these things are coming to pass, beloved. Verse 13, still in Matthew 24. But he that shall endure to the end shall be saved. Now this is, we're getting into where I wanted to get to. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. In all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination. Now remember, all these things happening. And all of these things have already happened. All of these things are happening now, even as we speak, right? Then he says in verse 15, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Now, one time it hit me, because like I brought up Titus. Now, if you know your history, if you know your history, this this symbolized this warning that Christ was giving the Christians was a, a, a pure warning of when they needed to get out of Jerusalem and get far away. And those who listened to Christ, you had see, you couldn't have just been a regular person, but you actually had to listen to him first and believe him. There were many who heard him and was like, yeah, right. Yeah, right. That, that little black dude with the nappy hair, he talking foolishness. Wasn't, didn't his mama have an adulterous relationship? Wasn't he born out of adultery to some carpenter? You know, yeah, right. You don't believe nothing he say. Crucify him. You don't believe nothing he say. See, you had to believe the words to hold on to him. And what happened was with the fault when Jerusalem, in, uh, it wasn't quite AD 70 yet. But when they first started the siege, when they first started the siege on Jerusalem, I actually have a history book right here. When they first started the siege on Jerusalem, who was in charge? It was Cestius. Cestius was in charge. And Titus and his dad, um, I always pronounce his dad's name wrong, Vespasius. <laughs> I'm going to just say that. Ves <sighs> Vespian, I won't say Vespian, but that's not his name. I always pronounce Titus's dad wrong, but he ended up when Nero died, Titus' dad ended up going back to Rome to become uh, emperor. Titus then takes over with Cestius uh, left off. But Cestius had surrounded Jerusalem. Hear me out. Cestius had Jer surrounded Jerusalem. We're talking about the abomination of desolation and what this has to do with women's ordination. Titus, I mean Cestius, had, had laid siege on Jerusalem. And then he retreats for no reason. But really, it was because of God. Now, when Cestius and this Roman army, when they first seized, it was the verse right here where we read, they were standing in the holy, they were standing on holy ground. So when normal people read Matthew 24, verse 15, where he says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, Verse 16, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. And then he gives, he's giving them heed. He says, let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field turn back to get his clothes. He's basically saying, hurry up. When you see, when you see this happen, leave, leave. Don't try to say, you know, next year when my credit is right. We're going to move out into the country or when I get this promotion on my job. No, he's saying when you see these things go. And so when you see when you see the abomination of when you see paganism, let me now. now I wanted to give the Bible. Now let me word it in Joshua terms. When you see paganism, when you see the armies of paganism, because the history is you had this Roman army 
surround and stand on holy ground. And when Cestius for a while, they're, 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 they have Jerusalem siege. They, they're, they're surrounded by, and then he just pulls the army and goes. They leave. The Christians who held on to Christ, the Christians who believed Christ, because like I said, if you didn't believe, if you, if you thought he was just a fluke or some carpenter, you didn't hold on to the words and you didn't take heed to the warning. So the Christians, the ones who were actually following Christ, who believed him and who were paying attention, when Cestius and the army pulled back, they knew that that was their cue. Because right when the army first came, they... They became an abomination because you had this pagan Roman army on holy ground. They became an abomination, but then they, they made it desolate. They left. They, they, they just fled. And that's when the Christians, the abomination of desolation. They were standing, this pagan Roman army was standing in the holy place on holy ground. But when they left, the Christians who were listening to Christ and paying attention knew that that was their cue. And they... They got out of there. They got out of there. The other Jews who was who was distracted, didn't believe Christ and his message, and were too busy. Oh, we 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 chased the Romans away. They stayed in Jerusalem. They stayed there. And they we know the story. And in AD 70, when Titus returned, killed them all. Killed them all. But y'all might say, Josh, what does that have to do with women's ordination? I wanted to show the first, because people will say, Josh, uh, the abomination of desolation is when Titus came and did it. I wanted to share. Yes, I know. Yes, yes, I know. Yes, I know. And, and like I say, you can easily read up on it and Google it. AD 70, the fall of Jerusalem, when Titus came back, things of that nature, and laid siege. They had already been laid siege for years. AD 70 is when it actually fell, when, when it was over. But anyway, so look at the symbolism here. Because like I said, that's the beauty of God and how he writes. One thing can, can symbolize and mean one, two, three, four, five, six other things when it's concerning the Bible. Okay? And that's, that's, that's just what it is. So the actual thing was, here Christ is warning them. When you see a pagan army, let me word it like this. When you see uh, the, uh, 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 the armies of paganism, when you see the army of paganism stand in the holy place of God, in his temple, know that the end is near. And that's the abomination of desolation. You might say, well, what does women ordination have to do with the armies of paganism? Beloved, like I said before, I, I, I still have it out there. Show me one, one, one female priest, not prophet, not saying prophet. Show me one female priest or minister or elder that was in Israel, Israel, in the Bible, and I'll believe in women's ordination. But I can show you where the only female priests that are in this book were all pagan. Remember when Paul came, came upon Diana and her priestesses, which were actually whores? The only female, let me say it again, the only female priests mentioned in here are all pagans. All pagans. Now that's key. And what did I say? What, what, what's been happening in the past 30, I'm going to just say 30 years. We've seen thousands and thousands of all of a sudden now in all denominations, almost all, not all denominations are letting their women become priests and elders. But I'm a part of the Adventist church and we have. And like I say, even though our conference voted against it, we have rebellious ch churches and conferences. And like I say, churches, there's churches and conferences who don't do it and they still appoint their women elders. Well, well, Josh, there's not enough men elders. Okay, then don't have any. That don't mean because there's no men elders in the church. If you're a small church and you don't have no men elders, just let the woman serve. You don't have to give her the title. 
You don't have to you yourself become an abomination to God because he's not going to look at it as a light thing. Which leads to Ezekiel 8. Let's go to Ezekiel 8. Where this chapter is sobering. And I'm almost done, y'all. I read in part one, I read Ezekiel 9 where judgment comes to the house. Is it a coincidence? As I read what I'm about to read. I want you to say to yourself, is it a coincidence that God lets us know? Um, we're about to, every time I read this, I can feel the anger. And I, I could imagine. The Lord said, just read. You're talking too much. Read. Ezekiel 8. He's talking to Ezekiel. And we're going to start. We're going to start at verse 4. At verse 4. Ezekiel 8, verse 4. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, according to the vision that I saw in the plain. Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now the way toward the north. Anytime, usually when he referred to the north, he was referring to his home, the sanctuary and his children. So I lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar. Y'all know, if y'all have been listening to me talk about the sanctuary, <coughs> y'all know I, I love talking about the gate as we talk about the sanctuary pattern. So when he says he sees the gate of the altar, he's talking about the sanctuary. And he's going to make it clear. But, excuse me, the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. I had to. Ezekiel, he says, when God told him, go look at my house, look at my house. First thing he says, he sees an image at the gate of jealousy. Who's the father of jealousy? Satan. Not only is the father of lies, he's the father of all things detestable. He was, he's the father of unhappiness. God is saying he saw the image of jealousy standing in the gate. He's saying, that's no longer my house. Keep reading. Keep reading. Okay. He said, furthermore unto me. No, he's basically saying, somebody is occupying my house. Because that's... Verse 6. Verse 6. He said, furthermore unto me, son of man, seest thou what they do? Now he's going into detail. Keep this principle in mind when you're studying the Bible, beloved. He does it. God does it throughout the whole Bible. He'll tell you something. Then he goes into detail. He said, furthermore, seest thou what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary. The abominations that they're doing in the house is driving God away. I was going to wait to the end. Didn't God say concerning the church of Laodicea, Jesus isn't in the church? Because at the end, which I'm going to show after I read this, he's saying, behold, I stand at the door and knock at the sanctuary. Christ is outside the sanctuary knocking, trying to get back in. Why was Christ put out the sanctuary? Could it be the rules were changed? He didn't recognize the priest there. Maybe getting ahead of myself. Anyway, I'm in verse 6. Even the great abominations, did he say little abominations? Did he say pet sins? He said the great abominations that the house of Israel commit here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary? And he has a question mark like, I got to leave my house? But turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. Beloved, one of the things I'm going to talk about this week, I have a lot of Christians on my YouTube who are first day Christians who worship on Sunday. Beloved, Monday, Monday I'm doing, or, or if my plans get canceled tomorrow, I'm doing it tomorrow. But Monday I'm doing a, a, a study on sun worship. Why you worship on Sunday. Like I told a, a, a friend, I got several friends of mine who who are ministers on Sunday and I told I said they said Josh I said I said first 
tell me why you worship on Sunday. Because they like to say, well, the day of worship doesn't matter. The day you worship doesn't matter. Okay, I say, okay. Then why do you work choose Sunday? If it don't matter, why don't you hold church on Tuesday? And somebody might say, we do. It's prayer meeting. I ain't talking about prayer meeting. Don't, don't, no childish arguments here. You know what I'm talking about. Why there's a specific reason why you worship the day that the Catholic Church said worship. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm getting ahead of myself. Remember the abomination of desolation. Remember it was, it was, it symbolized the Roman pagan army standing in God's holy ground, right? And what does this have to do with women or nation, right? The only time women priests are mentioned in here are pagan, pagan priests that were under during Roman rule. Roman rule did we see women priests. Okay, let me finish, let me finish. But he says at the end of verse 6, and thou shall see greater abominations. So not only is worshiping on Sunday an abomination in the sanctuary, and I'm going to go in detail when I deal with Sunday worship for my friends who I love who worship on Sunday, who have more of a, who, a, a love and understanding of just the pure essence of love from the Bible than a lot of Adventists who worship on the right day. And I had to say that because just sometimes at Venice we get the big head. Oh, I worship on Saturday, the right, the rightful day. And and I've seen so many Adventists look down on their the brothers and sisters who worship on Sunday. But the brothers and sisters who worship on Sunday get it. They deal with love, love, love. I've had brothers and sisters even just recently, and I deleted his comment where they saw me with an earring. And this is fellow Adventist brothers and sisters see me with an earring and Josh. You're lost and you're going to hell. You know, no love, no reaching out to me when the Bible says go privately to your brother if you got ought. And some people say, well, I don't know how to reach you. No, really? I have even in my community says if you want to talk to me, go on Facebook or message me or even go like some people have done. And, 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 and in the comments, hey, brother Joshua, what's your email? I'd like to talk to you. So, so please stop knocking your, your first day brothers and sisters because they may be closer to the vine than you. Okay, finish reading Josh, finish reading. Okay, verse 7, I'm back in Ezekiel 8 verse 7. And he brought me to the door of the court, there at the sanctuary. And when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then said he unto me, son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw and behold every form of creeping things, dancing, music, and abominable beasts, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall. And now when I say music, I ain't just talking about music. I'm talking about like... When I started studying the sanctuary and I learned that the angels, because they're in the house of God, the seraphims, take wings, hold them up, and another pair of wings even close their eyes and they bow their heads because they are in the house of God, before God. We have made the house of God a common thing. Remember my dream? If you, you, if you haven't watched part one, please, because in part one, for those who haven't watched part one and you just jumped into this one, which is totally fine, in part one I talked about the dream I had last night. And in that dream, like I, I said, for y'all who saw part one, like I said, I was in the church with all races and denominations, and it was a rock concert. God was not there. Some were dancing over in the corner, and I've seen women use the sign language like Paul said. If nobody's deaf in the church, that's just a, in, in, in a form of dancing. They say, but Josh, it looks so nice and beautiful, but honestly, coming from a man, I'm being straight up, straight up. Y'all can, whatever, but I'm being honest. Seeing a woman in a, a black leotard and and doing all of this, you know, it's not it don't really go good with some of us men up here when we're not we're not trying to go to church and be lusting. I'm just being straight up. I've seen some of the, the, the women and I'm like, I didn't look at you like that before. I didn't know your hips were shaped that way. I can almost see your private print and all that stuff. Yes, I'm saying it because you need to hear it. Other men don't tell you because maybe they like it too much. And some people don't see no problem with it, but it's just dancing. It, it, there's nothing wrong with it. Just don't do it in the sanctuary. Like if you have a fellowship hall, do it in your fellowship hall. Don't do it in the actual sanctuary. It's holy. 
It's holy. I had I saw a, a guy, a young guy. You know, if y'all, I, I got I, I do rap. I be rapping and I, and I make music. And of course, because God told me to this morning, I'm gonna do way a lot more teaching now. But uh, there was a young guy. He was rapping and. Throw your hands, and this is how we all say, it's like, throw your hands from side to side in the sky. And I'm sitting there. And I'm like, all right. And the people stood up, and the beat was going, and they dancing. And I'm eye level. And, I, and this is the ironic thing. I looked at the youth, the young boys. I saw a boy looking up at his mom. And his mom is doing all like this in the sanctuary. And if y'all know, and, and a, some, a lot of y'all women are pretty healthy in the back. And for us who are sitting eye level with the pew, guess where your butt is? Right there. No, I'm for real because I'm seeing different. And I and I remember, like, man, putting my head down because I'm like, ah, oh, man, I'm not trying to. I, I I lust automatically almost. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, and and they're dancing, so the butt is jingling. Yes, you need to hear it. And I saw the boy, me and his eyes met, and I saw him looking at his mom in disgust, like, sit down. You're embarrassing me. We've allowed just everything in the churches. Everything. Holding raffles. Somebody put a, in my hometown church, somebody put a Christmas tree. You know, and I love, I love her to death. Like I said, I know who did it. But I'm like, you put a, something that came from pagan rituals. And somebody, and, and they use the excuse what Ellen White said, you can put a Christmas tree. No, she didn't say put one up in the sanctuary. She said it's okay to put one in the church if you're having a fundraiser and the people could stick money, but like you put in the Vesta view. In the Vesta view, if, if you're holding a fundraiser or a raffle and you're placing gifts, I mean, in the money on, not, not a raffle, but to raise money, if you want to do it that way, if you have to do it, do it that way. But you don't put it up in the sanctuary. In the sanctuary, guys. You put in something that was built to worship pagan deities. Which was just demons back in the day. Satanic rituals that we have okayed today. And think because it's okay today that God isn't sitting here looking at it like... Well, he just said, Josh, tell him how I feel. Read to him how I feel about it. Because remember, he said, he called, he already said, let's go back up to verse 6. He said, even the great abominations that the house of Ere committed here, like putting up Christmas trees, which the whole ritual came to praise and they used to do child sacrifices to them. Christmas was outlawed in all of Europe and the world until the 1800s when they put it back up today because it used to be such a, 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 a riotous ritual of getting drunk, sleeping around, all of this. But they used to actually, back way before, one of the reasons why they outlawed it was they would hold, okay, Lord said do it. Dur during the winter solstice ritual, they would set certain logs on fire that would burn for a long time. And while these logs were on fire, the they would do human sacrifices for the upcoming grain and harvest, hoping that the sun come out and this winter season would end. They would do sacrifices, human sacrifices. And that was that's what the way the Christmas tree is set up with the star on top. And this is with the lights. That's why if you look at a Christmas tree, they have the lights going around it from a distance, it looked like it's on fire. It's made to look like it's on fire. And the gifts are placed up under it. The sacrificial gifts are placed up under it. But anyway, that's just one. Just to go there. Just to go there. And which, like I say, I'm doing videos breaking this down in more detail all week. Especially the one on sun worship. Worshiping on Sunday. But anyway, so we, we, we see Christ. I mean, God is telling Ezekiel they're doing great abominations in the house. But then he doesn't stop there. He says, but look. They're doing even greater abominations. He didn't just say they're sinning. He's saying, here, he's saying they're greater abominations. And then he's saying these things are pushing him away. They're pushing him away. But, but anyway, we're back down in verse 10. Go Ezekiel 8, verse 10. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things, and abominable beasts, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. They're just allowing anything in the churches nowadays. 
And there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. And in the midst of them stood Jezani, the son of Shaphan, and every man his sitzer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then said, hmm, that censer, but this time it isn't an angel holding it. These are men who are committing an abominations in the sanctuary, holding these censers with incense. So they're trying to, mercy. I said in part one how the incense is the merits and blood of Christ that, that the angel put with the prayers of the saints to make us presentable before God. So look at this. God is saying you have the leaders in the church in the last days. All of this is Ezekiel 8 is talking about the last days, our time, the condition of our church. And he's saying you have the leaders in the church holding the merits of Christ and the blood of Christ in the middle of all these abominations, making the blood almost null and void. Mercy, I'm glad it ain't completely Null and void. You know? But listen what he says, verse 12. Then said he unto me, son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients... Now, 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 how hypocritical is that? I got to stop there. The Holy Spirit said, you're moving too fast. How hypocritical is that? These leaders are supposed to be upholding the blood of Christ and the merits of Christ's righteousness, but they have all these abominable and detestable things in the house. Okay, then verse 12. Then said he unto me, son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Hmm. Remember them rebellious conferences? Pastors who are commissioning women, elders and priests anyway? Do in the dark every man in the chambers of his imagery? For they say the Lord seeth if not, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. He said also unto me, turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. And this is why I'm going to deal with sun worship, because Tammuz is the prince of sun worship. That's where you get the cross from. The cross was made after Tammuz. See, the Egyptians were the first to make the cross. It was called the Ankh. And that was the symbol that Prince, the musician Prince, he had that, that what they call the Egyptian cross. It's, real, it's called the Ankh with an A. A-N, I forget how it's spelled. But it was made after Tammuz. Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz. Tammuz, without, having, without going into what I'm going to share on Monday, but Tammuz was supposed to be the child of Nimrod. But if you know the story of paganism, you know that Semiramis had Nimrod killed and she was actually having an affair with somebody else. And that's why Tammuz was murdered because Nimrod was a great hunter. And everybody, of course, she hid her adultery and she said, I don't want to get into this story, but let's just say Tammuz, because he was not Nimrod's son, ended up being killed, trying to kill a wild boar. And you know, the the animals back then were even bigger and stronger. So he's trying to be like his dad, poor Tammuz, because that really wasn't his dad. And so he, he gets killed. And so they ended up making a holiday after him in paganism that went from Genesis all the way up to the ages. Matter of fact, I was just dealing with it with the Christmas tree. Everybody right now, not right now, you can do it now. Google the birthday of Tammuz. Don't Google nothing else. Just Google Tammuz's birthday. And watch how many links about Christmas pop up. December, yes. Because er everybody knows Christ was born in like the spring or the fall or the summer. How do we know that? Because the shepherds had their sheep out. They don't put the sheep out in the winter time. It's in the mountains over in Israel. It gets winter. It's cold over there too. They don't bring the sheep out and the shepherds out in the field in the winter time. Christ was not born in the winter. Christ was actually born in the, during a hotter time. So what birthday are we celebrating on December 20th? You're celebrating Tammuz. Like I say, this rabbit hole is deep, y'all. But, uh, but we're talking about women's ordination. And the Lord just told me to stay on track because we're going I'm going to get into that on Monday when I deal with sun worship, sun worship. But anyway, but so you see here, God is saying 
They're worshiping Tammuz. They're sun worship in his sanctuary. How many churches worship on Sunday? Like I said, I'm going to get into that this week. I'm going to get into that more this week. But anyway, anyway, where am I at? Verse 13. Then he said unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he, for 14, then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Oh yeah, and the Catholic Church calls this holiday to this day Lent. Lent. And they say it's mourning. They, they only tell you they're mourning because you automatically assume that they're mourning for Jesus. Everybody does. When really... What do they put on their forehead? Like when you see, uh, I, I remember seeing pictures of uh, a lot of Hispanics in the streets in Mexico and they were whipping themselves and they all had crosses on their foreheads. T's, T's. Why do you have the T? Like I said, the cross that the Romans hung Christ on was actually after Tammuz. In pagan religion, when they killed you, they killed you on their God. They're basically saying that their God just conquered you. That's what they tried to do with Christ by hanging him on the cross. But anyway, anyway, keep going because this is about women's ordination and abomination of desolation. And I want you to read these next, these next couple verses. Mercy. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than some people worshiping on Sunday in my house. He's saying there's greater things, more, more worse things taking place in my sanctuary. And he says, and he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. Uh-oh. The inner court is the holy place. Now we're dealing with sanctification. In the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men. Twenty-five men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east. And they worship the sun toward the east. For, for people who says God wasn't talking about sun worship, like I said, he'll say something, and then he'll go into more detail. So now he just calls it out. They're worshiping the sun in my sanctuary. The S-O-N, I mean the S-U-N. In my sanctuary. Verse 17. Then said he unto me. Has thou seen this O son of man? Is it a light thing. To the house of Judah. That they commit the abominations. They commit here. I got mercy. I feel heat. Every time I read this. I cannot help but feel the heat. Some people say. Josh you're exaggerating. Am I? Am I? Wait till I finish reading this verse in the very next verse. Then said he unto me, Has thou seen this, O son? Is it a light thing? When people say, It's no big deal what day we worship. It's no big deal about a woman, priest, or minister with the title being ordained in God's house. That's like me having mud on my boots. Knowing my mama told me don't track no mud in the house and she loves and keeps her carpet a certain way and I just like it ain't nothing. Mercy, I can't even imagine. I can't even keep going in that analogy. I just pictured my mom heat and fire and you know, but he says, is it I'm in verse 17, uh chapter 8, is it a light thing to the house of Judah? He's saying to my people that they commit the abominations they commit here. For they have filled the land with violence. All this rebellion, arguing, doing sneaky stuff, violence, and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore, will I also deal in fury? He's saying, since you don't care and you think this is okay to me that you can march through my house with muddy boots on and I don't care tracking up my carpet sit, jumping on my couches moving my furniture around putting the cups in this cabinet you since you don't care he says therefore I will I also deal in fury mine eyes shall not spare neither will I have pity and though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. Mercy. God is, y'all don't, I'm, God is saying, 
He even said, if you whisper, you can think to the Lord and he hears you. He said, you can cry with the loudest voice and I'm not going to hear you. I'm not going to, if God says he's not going to have mercy, can you imagine God saying he's not going to have mercy? He says, yet will I not hear them. And he's saying this because of everything they did in his sanctuary. Then he goes straight into Ezekiel 9. What I read in part one, the judgment of the church. So he's saying you have a army of paganism in his house. You have an abomination of desolation in his house. Then here comes judgment to the church. The only, the only religions I've ever seen with female, female priests were the pagan Roman ones in this. And I ain't just saying Roman, but you get what I'm saying. So when y'all say, Josh, how is women ordination the abomination of desolation? They have made God's house desolate of God. Didn't he say it? Let's go back. Go back to verse 6 in the same chapter. He said, furthermore, to me, son of man, seest thou what they do, even the greatest abominations that, that the house of Israel committed here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary? They have made the sanctuary desolate with their rebellion and with their rules that they have all of, all of a sudden you hear people saying today, you know, like, oh, it's okay today. And that's just in the past 30 years. So I'm saying like, wow, you telling me these thousands of years all of a sudden is just mystical, magical, poof. It's okay for women to be elders and ministers. You telling me through all the the Reformation and all the 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 the, uh, the Christians who bled and died the wall densies and living in catacombs and uh, the Old Testament and uh, the New Testament and John the Revelator and Paul and uh, you know Daniel and David and uh, you know all the way back to the Garden uh, the Garden when a woman when the devil talked e into being priest and Adam because he loved her and said she is perfect she is beautiful listen to her and let her lead y'all might say how did she lead she took him the fruit it's the Garden Eden all over again. Satan is breaking down the structure of it all. Breaking down the structure of it all. Paganism has gained control of God's house. Go to Revelation. Go back to Revelation. Right to Revelation. Let's read about the church of Laodicea. The last day church, our church. I hope I've shed a little more light on the last day church and reading Ezekiel 8. Starting in, in I think I started Ezekiel 8 around verse 4 around there. I thought that's what it was. But anyway, anyway. Because thou sayest, concerning Laodicea, because thou sayest I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable and poor, blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. That thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thy eyes with thyself, that thou mayest see. They're in church, naked. God is not there. They're poor, miserable, ugly. They're detestable. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's not in the church. What has forced him to leave? Could it be the priest that he don't recognize? Could it be this abomination of elders 
and priestesses who are women. It's not just that, it's everything, it's everything, but like as you saw, there's levels to the abominations. He says, oh, these are great, but it, abomination is an abomination, don't get me wrong. Because he says, these are great abominations, then, uh oh, these are greater abominations, then let me show you an even greater abomination. He told Eve, your husband shall rule over thee. But men today are saying, she can be a priest. Now, how's that even possible? Where's the logic? If the man, how, if the man is priest and head, if the man is head of the home, but a woman can be priest, the priest is the head. Could that be why homes are falling apart? Because nobody understands their roles, and not one role is bigger than the other. We're talking about the nurturer. That's the most important role of a home the women have the honor of having the most crucial role to raise the children and to affect the minds so it's not like when people say it but the devil has made you look at it as a bad thing and not he ain't make you look at it like the wheels to the car yeah the man is the car but you also got the wheels or no the man is the wheels he's the priest and the woman, the, the, the body, the nurturer, who actually houses the children, you need both to have a fully running car. Can you, how far will a car go with no wheels? Nowhere. But what's, what's wheels with no, no bed, no, no car to sit in? You, you know what I'm talking about? The frame. You need both. You can't have the, the frame talking about I want to be the wheels. Like I said, if Gideon, who done, why, 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 why nobody heard it? Why, 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 why isn't that taught in the churches? Hold your elders and your ministers accountable. Make them study. Too many times, little watered down. You know, I had a pastor say he don't even like doing Bible studies. I mean, prayer meetings. You know, uh, Pastor Wayne Long, who I love and respect. Uh, very good pastor. He He'll travel. It don't matter if it's one or two people there. He's going to come and hold prayer meeting. And I've heard uh, opposite from uh, pastors who I was close friends with who, who not knowing how I look at it would say, man, it really ain't nobody there. I'm not going to do prayer meeting. I don't want to drive 30, 40 minutes. And I'm sitting here like, are you kidding me? Are you really just a hireling? You went and went to Oakwood and graduated and you don't, you have a problem you're getting paid and you have a problem and so I told him straight up I was like man I'll do it I'll do it and when he saw that the members were coming then it was no 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 I'll do it I'll do it I'll do it I'll do it then you want to go do it beloved study hold them accountable let's start studying the time is nigh judgment is beginning at our house People gonna call me or say I'm a false prophet. It's like my mama said earlier, cause I already had people. I posted just I just told about my dream and I shared it to certain Facebook pages, and there were some people. Oh, false prophets shall come and deceive many. Like I say, I'm 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 built for this. I was I've always been pointed at, and so I'm used to it. And I was just smiling, and told mom, and my mom first thing she said, she said, "You just told about a dream. You didn't prophesy anything." I said, "I know." But it's, uh, I have to be prepared for it because people are going to say, I am a messenger of the Lord. I am. I saw his arm January 22nd, I mean, <laughs> 1999. His, his hand all the way up to his elbow, the sky open. I dreamt the whole chapter of Zechariah 3. Go read it. Where there's a, a Joshua who's filthy, standing before God's throne. And God takes his clothes off of him. Gives him a brand new white raiment. And told him <laughs> to go judge my house. I used to say in my head, Father, if that's me or if I'm a messenger, I don't want it. Because so many people have been so mean and ill to me. And things of that nature that mean that you have seen it. You right there witnessing it. If I'm your messenger. And then I thought about it. All of that stuff should have pushed me away from the church. 
but I wouldn't allow it because I knew it was nothing but the devil. I'm still in the church. I'm still in the Venice. Even though, like I said, I've been disfellowshipped twice. I've been outcasted. I've been lied upon. I had an elder uh, come and help tear apart my home by scheming with my wife behind my back and spreading rumors about me for months to other leaders in the churches while he had this little relationship going on with my wife and I got heartbroken. I committed adultery and all of that in the church. You know, I'm going to tell my faults too. You know, and, and and that was years ago, and I and it and it broke me and it hurt me, and I and I stopped teaching for a while, and, and everything, and then I started to get sick in my body, and like I said, I never told you to stop teaching. So basically, what I'm saying is, beloved, forget who I am. I'm just a sinner, and and I'm just glad that God told me this morning. He reaffirmed to me when those kids looked at me and said, Josh. There's a question mark by your name. I'm just glad it wasn't an X in the book. And they say, come with us. Come with us. Because they knew. I know question mark means that I can. It's not decided yet. I can decide it. And, and I'm just saying like nothing here is worth holding on to. Nothing on earth is worth holding on to. Nothing. What's here? Nothing but pain, sorrow, destruction. I can only imagine how heaven is. I can only imagine. When Satan and his angels was kicked out of heaven, he begged Christ to be let back in. Not because he was sorry, but because he missed heaven. I'd rather take my chance with heaven and God. But not just heaven. God deserves all praise. Wonderful. Even for giving us this opportunity to be redeemed. See, Satan and his angels hate you because they can't be redeemed. The lake of fire is made for them. They can't be redeemed, but me and you can. And I don't care if people look at me like stuff. Like I said in part one, I was the shooter. I was the fighter. I was the one who went to the club. I wasn't dancing. Most of the time I'm on the wall watching everybody waiting for something to pop off. You know what I'm saying? Things of that nature. <laughs> and I don't care if people say, we soft, he changed, and he this. I don't care. I want to go to heaven with my children. I want to... I want to bug the Father. I want to hug Christ. I want to meet who I'm named after. I want to meet Joshua. or well, really Christ. Because Joshua means salvation. Hashua. There's nothing here worth holding on to. Misery. Pain. Beloved. Some of y'all can doubt me. Whatever. I ain't saying doubt me. But just put my words to the test. Study. Judgment is coming to the churches sooner. It's already here, but I'm talking about the last phases of judgment. The last phases of judgment is coming to the churches, beloved. Get right. Fill up your lamps with oil, the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to deal with that with diet. The Holy Spirit can't dwell where there's death and destruction. When you eat meat, you're partaking in death. Didn't something die for you to eat it? I'm going to deal with that later this week because the devil tells you, you don't have to worry about God's diet. Or like people say, Christ ate meat, Christ. We're going to deal with all of that, beloved. Like I said, I'm, I'm just glad that I had a I'm just glad I had a question mark by my name. That means there was no X. Because like I say, I thought I was X'd out already. And I said, Lord, though you slay me, I'm still going to love you and be positive for my kids and my babies. I'm just glad that it's not an X, beloved. When I looked at that book and I thought that I was lost, my heart truly dropped. I'm talking about that feeling was indescribable. Many of you Christians have heard about Judgment Day your whole life or as long as you've been studying the word. Until you, you're you standing there and your fate, and you know your fate is being decided. I can't, that's the reason why I've just done two videos. I've been sharing to every 20-something Facebook pages. 
just a dream and I'm about to upload these on YouTube now and I'm gonna share them to those 20 some pages this is why I don't care about the criticism when people are gonna say Josh you you so you're a messenger now you've been locked up 27 times you're a hoodlum you just uh, humiliated your neighbor